Hello folks, I'm Dennis Allen and welcome to The Disciple Dilemma. Today we want to talk about the question, can culture, capitalism, and Christianity actually be compatible? How could and how should disciples function in a, in a secular and pluralistic world? Uh, with me today hosting the show is Dr. Raymond Monroe. Raymond has been a spiritual mentor of mine, discipling me for a number of years, um, even though he is an Auburn grad. Um, I, I guess that's kind of proof that grace abounds. We're <laughs> glad to have you here, Raymond. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> and here's somebody else who's been deeply influential in my life, uh, not as many years, but uh, in some wonderful ways. Simon Edwards, live from the Oxford, UK. We are so amped to have you here, Simon. Thanks so much, Dennis. I am amped to be here as well. Uh, the wonders of modern technology that we can uh, cross the pond uh, through the internet and have this conversation with yourself and Raymond. I'm really looking forward to seeing where it goes. We, we miss being with you, but we're so delighted we got this digital moment together. Um, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about Simon, folks, just so you can get an idea of the horsepower we've got with us today. Um, I should start with the most important thing. He's married to Natasha Tosh, uh, who herself is a discipling pastor at Latimer Community. Now that in itself is a fascinating story, which I think I'm going to have to pay Simon a lot of money and get some time with her on this as well. Uh, Simon and Tash have three children, and uh, that's, that's the beautiful family background for them in Oxford. Simon is kind of an A-list guy. And what I mean by that is he is an attorney, an Australian, an apologist, an author, I guess if you could spell economic with an A, he's an economist. Um, he, he's a speaker who has worked around the world, uh, not only in the lawyering that he did in Australia, but uh, was it 2011, Simon, that you came to Oxford? It was, yeah, in September of 2011. Wow. Okay, so 2011, the family shows up in Oxford. Simon's been studying at Oxford and at ACA, and now he is teaching there. Um, he's spoken on university campuses all over Europe, you know, including the big houses, Oxford and Cambridge. He's been to Hong Kong, Oslo. He's been to Queensland. He's been to banks and businesses and government and churches and conferences. You just find him in a lot of places. He's got a fantastic personality, great delivery. He's a very thoughtful person. Um, you can catch him on a lot of BBC radio shows, uh, Christian podcasts. People look to him because of his background, not only in the legal world, but also his studies in education and economics and apologetics. Uh, unbelievable, I think. Justin Barley's crew, he's been on, on that beautiful premiere uh, podcast and uh, facing the canon with, uh, with that incredible guy, Jay John, uh, from England as well. And today we're going to talk to Simon about his book, which is The Sanity of belief, why faith makes sense. And this is going to be a, a fantastic question. So Simon, thanks again for being, being with us here today. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm, I, like I said, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Well, so I guess the first thing I'd like to ask you um, is to give us a little bit of a lift on the ACA, the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. For some of the people listening, they don't even know it exists. Tell us a little bit about what you guys are up to there with the team and um, what it's about and what's available for people. Right. So the, the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, it's a, it's a ministry uh, based out of Oxford, as the name might suggest. Uh, we do training and equipping for Christians in how to talk about Jesus uh, with people who don't go to church without making them want to run away from you and how to deal with the tough and difficult questions facing Christians today. Um, we, we, um, you might also be aware that um, we were for um, uh, many years associated with RZIM and Rabbi Zacharias. So it's been a very challenging time over the last few years with all that happened surrounding that, a lot of processing and reflecting on our responsibility as just being part of a global team in which uh, what happened happened there and um, and then uh, last year spending a lot of time reflecting and speaking to leaders from Christian ministries and networks from all over the UK just canvassing their view as to what they would want for this um, ministry based in Oxford we um, we we separated from 
uh, our ZAM at the beginning of the last year, 2021, and um, and launched as an independent organization after taking stock. And, um, you know, we've just spent a lot of time asking Christian leaders, uh, is this the sort of ministry that you want to continue? And we've just had an overwhelming um, sense of people saying, uh, you know, we do need this type of ministry more than, than, than ever before. Um, and so as a team, we're a much a smaller, uh, I would say, team after all that's happened, very much trying to learn from the mistakes uh, of what's happened in the past, as well as really looking into the, the future and, and, and being excited for the continued opportunity and role that we have to reach people and reach our culture with the beauty and relevance of, of Jesus. And so with all that's happened in the last couple of years with COVID as well and things opening up with the technology that we have today, uh, a lot of what we did traditionally in the past, uh, we're looking to do and to make more accessible with online uh, training and developing a curriculum of training and equipping for, for Christians, both in the UK and now all over the world because of what's enabled with technology to sort of have introductory sessions on evangelism and on learning to share your faith with credibility uh, and with winsomeness and then moving into deeper and deeper uh, forms of study of evangelism and apologetics through to very advanced stuff, dealing with really some of the deep philosophical questions of the day. So that's very exciting. Um, and what my uh, job looks like uh, in the meantime, we've been very blessed by God's grace to have continued to have lots and lots of invitations to come and speak at, uh, at um, workplaces and schools and churches just to uh, give a a presentation of what Christian faith is all about, how it speaks to the big questions of life, meaning, morality, purpose, uh, and to field in open question and answer from people who don't go to church and can range anywhere from, you know, uh, open-minded to overtly hostile, the very deep uh, questions that people have today about Christian faith. So I just count that an absolute privilege to have the opportunity to do that and to point people to Jesus. Um, and another wonderful uh, aspect of being part of the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics is having had people uh, from all over the world come to do uh, training and the relationships that form as a result of that. And uh, Dennis, it was wonderful. You're such a memorable person to have had uh, training with us uh, in the, and, and in being involved in the business program. And that's another massive blessing as well. Um, and so I find it it's just a real joy to be on your um, on your podcast and reading your book, which is outstanding. Who are some of the big names along with the really cool Simon Edwards at the ACA that people bump into? Yes. So uh, some really wonderful people that we get to work with. So a lot of people would be familiar, for example, with uh, Professor John Lennox, uh, Sam Aubrey, Amy or Ewing, Oz Guinness, um, and that's just some of the some of the people that are involved with the um, with the with the ministry in one capacity or another, um, and that's what that's one of the wonderful things about being part of a ministry with a group of people as well, because different people have their specialisations in different areas of science and philosophy and theology and history, and and so we get to uh, you know it's a case of iron sharpening iron as we as we talk about things together and, and go go out and, and have conversations with people and come back in and discuss and discuss. Post COVID, the uh, curriculum and the opportunities are starting to wake up for people if they want to get involved with ACA. Have you got a couple of maybe uh, thoughts about some things coming up people could get involved with if they wanted to? Yeah, um, so we uh, very soon next next month, we're, we're doing a three day uh, conference um, in July for the uh, summer school uh, that will be happening um, at one of the colleges here in Oxford and there is um, availability for that. It had sold out um, very quickly and so we were able to speak to the uh, college that was um, hosting that and expand the numbers of people that we can have there. So um, that's quite hot off the press actually so that's exciting. Um, we've also, if you go to the website www.theocca.org uh, you can you can see about the online training programs that, that we're running um, uh, and, and there'll be a, a series of uh, training programs sort of eight training programs that we'll run every year and then there'll be 
sort of beginner, intermediate, advanced stages of that as the as the years progresses as well. So plenty of opportunity to um, come and get some training and, and get involved. And, and if there are any churches in the UK as well who want um, to help their congregation learn how to not run away from, but see the big questions that people have as an opportunity to um, share the beauty and relevance and goodness of Jesus, then you know, get con in contact with, our, with us on the website as well. And we'd love to have a chat about how we can come alongside because a big part of what we want to do as a ministry is, is just partner with people um, and uh, do things in synergy and, and in relationship with the many good ministries and churches who are already doing many wonderful things. You know, uh, folks, it would really be um, uh, just not fair if I didn't make this comment about ACA. Uh, in the last couple of days, I've been on a couple of different interviews, and the creed of a couple of the interviewers was, we use, not these specific words, but here's kind of the gist, we use blunt force trauma to force people to their knees so they have no choice but to surrender to the logic of our thinking so they'll know Jesus is Lord. At the ACA, what I found to be absolutely stunning, whether you were a CEO in a corporate America or a student just popping through the university or someone in midlife who's just trying to kind of um, look at faith in a new way, they taught us, they drilled into us. Simon alone in his little boot camp is going to make sure that 1 Peter 3.15 just explodes in your brain. And he can play with that later all he wants to have an answer for the reason for the hope. But to do that with gentleness and respect, you fear no question. As the Aka folks get done with you, you don't fear the questions. You're so comfortable with the human being in front of you. And the gospel is something they want to talk about instead of feeling like they're in some kind of cosmological debate. That's the beauty of the Aka. Simon, if people start getting curious about this, which we know they will. This is a fantastic program, whether you're a student or you're an executive, wherever you are in life, this is a fantastic program. What's the website? Give us the website so we can put that up on the screen too as we broadcast this. Yeah, thanks. It's www.theocca.org. Uh, and the OCCA stands for the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. And, and I loved what you said, Dennis, about... Um, you know, it's okay to defend your faith without being defensive and answer questions without being aggressive. And I think part of the reason um, that we end up preaching at people rather than having a conversation with people is because we just get so nervous and we think it's it's all about us. Um, whereas actually, if our focus was off ourselves a little bit and just on the person that is asking us questions, we'd be a little bit less nervous, particularly if we remember that often for the person asking questions, they can be nervous as well because sometimes uh, it might be the first time they've had the courage to actually ask a religious person a religious question. And so just being humanly interested in the person asking the question um, and engaging with them and just finding out why they're asking that question in particular and where they're coming from, it just makes it so much more a human interaction and a conversation rather than you're in a defensive position and the future of Christianity just rests totally on, on, on your shoulders. So I'm glad that you said that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's encouraging. Folks, we're talking with attorney and author and apologist and speaker, Simon Edwards. And we're about to roll into a conversation about his new book, The Sanity of Belief. That's coming up in just a minute. So if you're listening on Stitcher and Spotify and Apple and Audible, and I heart in those sorts of places, we're going to try to keep you teed up from an audio perspective. Those of you on video, you'll be able to see all of this as it's unfolding and going along. But stick with us as we talk with Simon Edwards about his new book, The Sanity of Belief. Simon, here's our transition point then. We've set up this whole idea of apologetics, and we've set up this whole idea of the people and the folks out there. You wrote a book. You wrote The Sanity of Belief. Tell us a little bit about why in the world you did that? And who were you thinking about when you wrote it? <laughs> Thanks for asking. Yeah, it's, it's called The Sanity of Belief, uh, Why Faith Makes Sense. Uh, and I wrote it for myself. And when I say that, I mean, I wrote it for my former teenage self. And what I mean by that is that I wrote it for people who um, haven't grown up going to church 
and because of the cultural milieu that they find themselves in, just have uh, a sort of unthought through assumptions that Christianity or belief in God is probably irrational, is probably irrelevant, and it's probably even immoral. Uh, and I wanted to help them see that actually trusting in Jesus Christ is the most sensible and the most rational and the most wonderful thing that you could possibly do with your life. So just to give you some background on my story, I, I grew up in a completely non-religious family background. We never talked about God. We, we didn't have a Bible. Uh, we never talked about religion. But being a human being, nonetheless, when I hit my mid-teen years, being forced to slow down because I had a knee injury, uh, I was playing lots and lots of sport and suddenly uh, I had a knee injury and I, I had all this time on my hands. And it just got me to thinking, I remember standing in the school playground at lunchtime and wondering to myself, is it true that we're just here through some random cosmic accidents, a combination of time plus matter plus chance? Is it true that we just live for 80 or 90 years if we're lucky and then we die and that's it, game over? And everything we've loved, everything which we've achieved, everything we are just dissipates into dust. And I remember thinking to myself, if that's true, it's sort of a sad story. And it would seem to render my life rather meaningless, a bit like a, I played video games at the time as a teenager. And I remember thinking, it's just like a video game where it doesn't matter how well you play the game. At the end, it's just blank screen, you lose. And I thought, that just doesn't feel right. I wonder if it is right. And the thing is, as a teenager, I had no idea where to go. Like, how do I figure out what life is all about? Where do, where do I go? What can I read? What This was before the days of the internet as, as well. So, so long story short, I wrote my book for people just like that, who are experiencing deep, deep desires that don't seem to be satisfied rising up in their heart and deep, deep questions about life and its meaning that can't seem to be answered they can turn to to find answers to these questions and satisfaction for these desires and to 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 take them on a journey to see how christian faith actually makes sense of their desires and their deep questions and how jesus himself is the uh is is the fulfillment of our deepest desires and the answer to our deepest questions and it's not it's not just a religion it's not just a, a worldview it's not just a series of thoughts and ideas it's a person who loves you and who made you and who holds the universe together and he wants to know you and he wants to have relationship with you so in the first half of the book what i try to do is try to in the words of blaise pascal um, the uh, French philosopher from yesteryear, I try to make people wish that Christianity were true. In other words, I try to help them see how good the good news really is. In an age, people doubt that it is good. And then in the second half of the book, I try to help them see that this good news really is true news. You don't have to leave your brain at the door to believe it. You can look at it through the lens of history and science and philosophy. Uh, and, it, and it holds up to, to, the, to the harshest rational, rational scrutiny, looking at the evidence and the reason for Christian faith. And I try to blend those things together. Uh, so, so people who are asking the big questions, is it, is it good and does it work? And is it true? And, and sort of bring these things together and, 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 and see how these things coalesce in Jesus. So in, in your target, you wrote Teenage Simon Edwards, a book, and I'm wondering, is that now thinking a little bit more broadly, is that book useful then for the disciple and follower of Christ and why? What would Simon Edwards say to that? Huh. Well, uh, I, one thing I need to be aware of is that in all likelihood, that book won't get into the hands of people who church other than through the hands of people who do go to church. Uh, so my hope is, so for example, you mentioned going on podcasts and radios and stuff. So it's just the other day I had the radio interviewer who read the book say, I love the approach of this book. I'm, I'm bought 10 copies and I'm, I've got 10 people in my, in my street. I want to, I want to give it to them. And for me, that's my real hope that, that the wow. book will have a ministry life of its own to get into the hands of people who aren't Christians. But I would say that if you are someone who has grown up going to church and you find it really awkward 
having conversations with people about Jesus who don't go to church. You find that when you get in the conversation, you you don't connect. People don't really understand where you're coming from. There's sort of a cultural mismatch. My hope would be that if you read this book, it will help, by example, Christians to um, to form an understanding of ways that are helpful to engage with people who haven't grown up going to church, who haven't grown up just assuming that the Bible is authoritative for life, who haven't grown up assuming that God is real, who haven't grown up assuming that uh, religion or belief in God is a good thing in and of itself. And, and I think that would be instructive for a lot of people who haven't uh, who, who have grown up in going to church, going to church and want to want to connect and be relevant uh, for people today, many of whom don't go to church. So your book seems, if, if I've got this right, you, you break up into sort of two segments. One segment, you talk about issues like meaning and value and goodness, truth, love and suffering. That's front end of the book. Second half of the book, you begin to talk about how do I know or have confidence in this? And you talk about the concept of faith. You talk about the idea of evidence around us, evidence within us in history. Is that, is that a fair characterization? That's a, that's a really great summary. So let me probe one of these and just toss a question out so people can get a sense of how this book feels as you're going through it. By the way, the book is deeply communicative. It, it, it is written by someone who has some gravitas theologically, but it reads so well for, for somebody like me. I can read this book and go, wow, I get this. Boy, there's, there's a lot of horsepower in the book. So I'm thinking about uh, page 21 in the copy that I read. We're under the subject of meaning. And the statement you make here is, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how, wrote the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. And so the question that I wanted to ask you is, how in the world would Nietzsche have a why? And how, how in the world do you think about a Nietzsche with a why? Tell me, tell me about Nietzsche in that, in that phrase you used. Uh, well, that's, for, that, that's, that's very interesting. It, it, um, I, think, I think Nietzsche was, was very good at, um, at recognizing things that were true. So he was very good at recognizing the difficulty of um, having uh, a firm foundation for... Um, morality that's objective and not just self-created and a firm foundation for meaning that's objective and not not self-created um so really the and, and so Nietzsche being an atheist he, he was very good at um at recognizing the um logical consequences of an atheistic uh worldview so it's so a Nietzsche Nietzsche said you know um if 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 there is no god um then we don't really have a, a rational foundation for having a sense of morality. So in, in terms of Nietzsche finding a why, um, to deep dive on him and his psychology, he really had to uh, create one for himself. Uh, and, he, and he went off on a very interesting tangent, which is finding a sense of meaning just in the expression of his own will uh, and um, being able to, to not be shackled by um, Christian ideals of love and mercy. He actually regarded Jesus's uh, teaching on um, having care for the poor and the vulnerable and turning the other cheek and that sort of thing as, as, um, as something to be despised. And he, he valued the, the ubermensch or the superman, the one who... Uh, unconstrained by any morals of anyone else is able to exert their will and, uh, and, and even dominance over, over other people. And um, it's probably not that well known that, that Hitler, Adolf Hitler was quite uh, influenced by Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy. Um, and, you know, sometimes we're tempted to think, oh, who cares what some ancient dead philosopher said about this or that? Well, ideas have far more consequences in our society than we can realize. And, and you can see in, in Hitler's concentration camps, the, the outworking of a philosophy that says, well, who's to stand in the way of my, my will uh, and, and my desire uh, for 
myself or or a people group that I identify as 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 superior. Um, and I mean, we could we could talk a lot about um, the where they can find a basis for meaning or for morality in the absence of God. But, but Nietzsche was very honest in saying that there is no objective one. So he, he just, he went on a very subjective path, I, I, I think. And, and, and the interesting thing is it's very difficult if you don't believe in God and you think that we, we should be able to create or determine what's right and what's wrong for ourselves. What if, what if you're a person who has that view, let's say that you are a secular humanist Mm. And you say, okay, we should decide for ourselves what's right and wrong. Uh, and let's decide for ourselves that racism is wrong. Well, what if they meet, uh, what if they meet, let's call them uh, a person by the name of Nietzsche. And let's say Nietzsche says, no, racism is not wrong. Um, why, why should one uh, person view that racism is wrong? Uh, triumph over another person's view that racism is not wrong, if we're able to decide for ourselves what's right and what's wrong. So the secular humanist finds themselves a bit conflicted because they want to say to the racist person, um, you're wrong, but they can't do that because they also believe that every person has to decide for themselves what's right and what's wrong. So the secular humanist sort of finds themselves conflicted because secular humanism is itself conflicted. And those are the sort of troubles we get ourselves into when we say, well, we can just create morality for ourselves. Folks, we're talking with author Simon Edwards, who has written a book called The Sanity of Belief. Simon is a lecturer at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. We're heading down the track to finish debriefing the book, and then Dr. Raymond Monroe is going to weigh in with Simon and chat a little bit about purpose and meaning under the guise of in culture and capitalism and Christianity. Can all that together be compatible? Okay, Simon, so I'm going to move over to your value section for a minute. And um, you made a statement, John Paul Sartre was perhaps the most famous philosopher of the 20th century. As an atheist, he argued there's nothing that makes us essentially human, let alone essentially special. He reasoned that since there is no God who has designed us, a human has no blueprint, no essence, no nature, therefore, we must create our own nature, value, and identity. And my question for you is, in Oxford, in the UK, and maybe even Australia, what kind of identity matters? Where are people going without God for identity? Hmm. Well, uh, without a, a given sense of identity, as Christians, we're in the enviable position of knowing who we are based on, on whose we are. Uh, and we can really rest in the acceptance of God's love for us um, as, as his children. Uh, with, with, without that, um, people tend to fall into basing their sense of identity, uh, not on whose they are, but on, on what they do. Um, and, uh, and that's often in terms of achievement. So uh, a, a, particularly in Oxford, where there's a lot of, you know, highly intelligent, highly successful people, uh, a lot of people live by the mantra, uh, mantra that life competition to be won or uh, I achieve, therefore I am, or uh, London, it's very common, he, who, he or she who dies with the most toys or trophies wins. Um, and it's very much trying to create our own uh, sense of identity. The, something that I think has exacerbated a lot of um, uh, mental, health, mental health issues and anxiety for years is the fact that this uh, sense of creating our own uh, sense of worth and identity uh, is, is one that um, used to be something where, how shall I put it? Um, let's say uh, Mr. or Mrs. Jones next door get themselves a new car or put an upgrade on their house. So suddenly you feel so slightly lesser in yourself because maybe they're doing a little bit better than, than you. And those sort of things would happen from time to time. But we now live in a society where our Instagram feeds and Facebook feeds are showing the success of people all around us every day, 24 seven. And so the, so young people in particular are feeling this, this, um, this anxiety, this sense of need for uh, appearance and impression uh, uh, management. Uh, and it's a 24 seven constant need that we're, that we're not using these, these tools of technology to, um, to connect with each other, but more so to, to market our lives to each other. 
Um, and the problem is, is that if we're basing our sense of our identity on how well we think we're doing, we will start to base it on how well we think we're doing in comparison to others. But if that becomes the case, I'm now in a situation where my sense of well-being and identity is uh, inversely proportional to how well I think others around me are doing. Uh, and if that's the case, it becomes genuinely difficult to celebrate the success of others. In other words, we end up being in a society in which we're competing with one another for acceptance, for recognition, and to be chosen and to be valued. And for young people, it's 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 a twenty four seven thing. Um, and and as far as from where I sit as a Christian, this is a, a burden, this burden to create or manufacture your own sense of identity, which we were never meant to bear. Um, there is a reason that we want to be special and that we want to have a, a special, a valued sense of identity. And it's because we are special. We are valued. We do. We are of innate uh, worth. It's just that we're looking for that and for the fulfillment of that in, in, in all the wrong places. And so when I talk to people on university campuses and workplaces today, almost everyone can relate to this thing, that to this uh, phenomenon, that it's not working. I'm, I'm not at peace with myself. I never feel like I'm good enough, successful enough, good looking enough, connected enough, popular enough. I'm just trying to keep up and it's as much as I can do to, to stay afloat. And so the message um, that we get to share as Christians, um, that you don't have to be good enough to be accepted by God. And you can just rest in what Jesus has done for you and his love for you uh, is very, very powerful. Uh, and, 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 and when people hear it, a lot of people get very thirsty and they want to know, tell, tell me more. Tell me more. Wow, folks, uh, we're talking with author Simon Edwards. The book is The Sanity of Belief. And uh, we're looking forward to a conversation now with he and Raymond about the, the ideas of meaning and identity and purpose under the rubric of is culture capitalism, Christianity, actually something compatible. Before we duck to Raymond on this, I've got to ask the question, where in the world do we go buy this book, Simon? The, the market that we service, if you look at our statistics, a third of the people are looking at this podcast are in the New York state area, 20% of them are in California, 10% of them are in Washington, DC, and the rest of them are all over the US, right? And there's a batch of folks, actually 5% in Croatia. Where do we get this book? <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, it's it, Published in the UK, um, but thankfully, to, thanks to this globalized, uh, connected world that we live in, uh, you can get it on. Uh, you might have heard of this little internet company called Amazon. Um, uh, they they also make available the book. So uh, Amazon and a number of different uh, Christian bookstores in the in the US. Simon Edwards, author of The Sanity of Belief, Why Faith Makes Sense, and an apologist speaker at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. We are indebted to you, Simon, for being with us today. Well, for me, it was an absolute pleasure. feels like such a privilege, and I've so been blessed by conversation with you both. Thank you so much. Folks, you'll be able to see um, toward the end here, once the, the credits roll on this, the website location for the ACA, the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. Also for the book, Sanity of Belief, which um, I checked while we were chatting here. It's on Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, as well as all the major distributors. And the independent booksellers are carrying it as well. And then, of course, there are the ebooks uh, available. <clears throat> so we'll link that up there for you uh, as well. And um, then with that, Raymond, thanks for being with us today and uh, helping to straighten up and clean up my act. That was great fun. Great fun. Thanks said uh thanks to raymond as well it's it's been a blast for me great folks we are um, asking all of you to take a look at our social media splash i'm not a big social media fan and perhaps you aren't either but in the crowded digital marketplace we're trying to get the word out that the operating system of discipleship in western christianity has been hacked and it's going to take disciples especially the leaders in the christian community to weigh in on the mission Christ called us to, the culture Christ caused us to, to forge and develop. And we need your help to disciple them to get the word out. We get great folks like Simon aboard with us to be able to spread these podcasts and videos around. 
but we also need you to like us. Hit us on Facebook with a follow, hit us on YouTube channel with a subscribe, they're free. Click the button, jump in. We would really appreciate your help. Plenty of places for you to send us questions and ask or make comments about what you see in content and what we're doing. And thanks very much for listening.